we read in Pirkei Avos, in Ethics of Our Fathers, there were 10 generations from Adam to Noah to show us to what degree God is patient. And because they did not correct their ways, he destroyed the world. And the only person who was left was Noah and his family. The 10 generations from Noah to Avram. And again, it shows God's unlimited patience. And then it concludes, Avram received reward for all the 10 generations. What they were meant to accomplish, that level is attributed to Avram. So we had explained the name of Rabbeinu Yonah, who's the commentary on the Pirkei Ovos. He explains the world has to meet a minimum level of objective. And if it doesn't, it doesn't pay for God to keep the world going. God gave the first 10 generations, 10 generations to hone up and provide what they were meant to provide, to give existence its level of worthiness. Noah could not pick up the slack. Noah only survived in his own merit, and his own merit allowed him and his family to survive. The rest of the world was destroyed because what was needed to maintain the world, nobody was able to pick up that slack. Therefore, God destroyed the world. Noah, on the other hand, tangented from Noah to Avram, Avram being greater than Noah, he was able to compensate for what the people had failed. Therefore, God says the world would not be destroyed. And because Avram had accomplished, filled in the gap what they were meant to fill in the gap, therefore, he's accredited for all that they were meant to have. Because the world has to meet a minimal level of achievement. Now, that's Rabbeinu Yonah in Pirkei Avos. When Adam ate of the tree of knowledge, before he ingested that fruit, the world was nearly perfect. The world was meant to be eternal. Adam was so holy that the angels had mistaken his holiness for God's radiance. When he ingested that fruit, which represents evil, good and evil, he brought back about a level of destruction and regression was still struggling with it till today. In Hebrew, it's with Kilkor. He was Mekalkel the world. He damaged the world almost on an irreparable level. What's meant to happen until the end of time, we're doing two things. To restore the world to where it should have been before he destroyed it, and then to advance it beyond that point to a level of perfection. So correcting the damage which was the most extreme level of devastation spiritually speaking the tzaddikim and the jewish people that's our responsibility and we have the ability and god gives us the means and he gives us the assistance that if we make the right choices we upgrade existence we're always in a restoration mode restoring what's lacking, which should have been, and on top of that, advancing it beyond that point. The tzaddikim are always in an advanced level, in advanced mode. God is always providing the means to, to them to be able to continue upgrade, to repair existence. So the tzaddikim are doing two things. They're addressing the kilkul, the damage. But addressing that is achieving perfection. The world is less, less imperfect, less imperfect. In addition, working towards ultimate perfection. And that's given through 
the Torah which was given to us at Sinai. And that's what we're called Odom. Atem Kriyam Odom, what was Adam's, what was his purpose to perfect ex existence? He failed. You failed, you're no longer Odom. You no longer have that ability. So that responsibility to perfect existence and bring it to a more perfect level, restore the damage and perfect it beyond that. That was given to the new Adam. That's the Jewish people. We are the people who are given the ability because we chose that Sinai to recognize God and to accept his narrative which is the solution for the restoration. Therefore, we were given that responsibility to bring about the restoration of the world, restoring the, restoring the world, spiritually speaking. That's Sinai. And that's the concept. You are Adam. You are classified as Adam. They're not. Adam failed. He was no longer Adam. He no longer can. We were given that. Okay? So every day, God, when he renews existence, the means which he provides is always another level of infusion so that tzaddikim and the Jewish people could advance the world as it has to be advanced. Besides maintaining the world, there's, there's a certain infusion of new energy. New energies which didn't exist until now because those energies are needed for the restoration. So in essence, who is the ultimate partner with God? The tzaddikim. The Jewish people as a whole, but the devoutly righteous who are always on the upgrade, they're not plateauing. They're not regressing. But their intent is always to go forward. They're the so-called the keepers. They're the keepers of the Jewish people. Now we said something interesting. We know that right always has a positive connotation. Left always has a negative connotation. You know, in Europe, especially in Germany, a person who's a left-handed person who was seen as something as a handicap. A person who wrote with his left hand was passed down through generations. Left rec represents negative. Right represents positive. Now the question is why? The Gemara tells us, the Talmud tells us that one, one does a mitzvah, you should do a mitzvah with your right hand. The right represents midas arachmin, the attribute of mercy. Or chesed, Left represents distance, a separation. The Talmud has an expression, small dochek, you mean the karev, that when you deal with the person, the left hand you push away, but simultaneously with the right hand you bring the person closer. That's how you deal with the person. Even if a person deserves to be castigated, you just don't throw them away. You don't cast them away. You let him know he's at it arm's length, but simultaneously you're trying to somehow to cuddle him to bring him closer. So it's a balance. But the right always has a positive connotation. When a Jew puts on a shoe, you put on your right shoe before your left shoe. Right always represents positive. We do a mitzvah, it's with our right hand. We put our hand in our jacket. You put your hand right hand in, into the sleeve before the left hand. Not because we're right-handed, because the right always has a more positive connotation. When the Kohen officiated on the altar and he would encircle the altar, do you encircle to the right or do you begin encircling to the left? So the Talmud tells us, Kol Pinoshapatopona, whenever you make any turn, the turn should always be to the right, not to the left. Kol Pinoshapatopona, you and Limin. Every turn you make, it's always you encircle to the right. You know, we speak clockwise and counterclockwise. 
counterclockwise is going to the right. Counterclockwise is backwards. That's called backwards. That's left. Now, in Kabbalistic terms, the, the Ramchal writes, God is, we speak about the right hand of God. That's God's giving. We were on the receiving end. God's on the giving end. God says, my right hand tapped out, forged this world. His right hand. We are the beneficiaries of God. When you're on the receiving end, relative to right, we're left. We're not contributors. We receive. We only become contributors when we utilize what we receive in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a constructive manner. When we use it and apply it and invest it positively, then we assume that semblance of the right. But after everything's said and done, we're still on, we're still on the receiving end. The Talmud tells us everything's predestined except free choice. If you have free choice, but you have no means, how do you actualize that choice? Person's born endowed with brilliance, with good health, with wealth. That's endowment. Now the question is, what do you do with it? That's fear of heaven. That's free, free choice. Do you acknowledge God? And therefore you go north, or you turn your back on God, you go south. That's free choice. But whatever way we operate and function, it's only within the parameters that God sets for us. The Midrash says, if a person has a male child, he's supposed to circumcise him. So God says, if I wouldn't give you the child, would you, would you be able to fulfill the mitzvah of circumcision? It's only because I've given you the male child, therefore you're able to circumcise him. Because we have an arm, we're able to put on tefillin. And because we have a brain, we're able to study the Torah. And we have, we have retention. We're able to make decisions. We're able to make evaluations. All that's endowment. The question is, what do you remember? Do you remember who won the World Series since 1921? And who pitched it? Is that what you use your memory for? Or the occupy your memory, the retention is something which is, has infinite value, which has to do with maintaining an existence. Your emotion, are you imbued with the love of God, with reverence for God, or imbued with love for other things? A reverence for other things, which have no innate value in terms of purpose of existence. So what are we? God is the influencer. He's the endower. We are the beneficiaries of that endowment. So relatively speaking, he's the right, we are the left. So whenever we engage with God, we always use our right hand because that connotes God's representation. That's an acknowledgement of him. We're giving it back to the source. The source is the endower. He's the benefactor. We're the beneficiaries. This, this is the idea. You know, it's interesting when we finish the Amido, we take three steps back. And we take three steps back, you're supposed to bow to the left, to the right, and to the center. You bow, when you bow out, you bow out, bent at the waist, because you, you're finishing an audience with God. The Amida is an audience. When you take the three steps forward, you're entering into an audience with God. And that's where he has God. Open my lips and allow us to speak your praises. And then we begin the Amida. When we conclude, we bend out the waist, we're bowing out, and we bend to the left, to the right, and to the center. What is the, that? What is that? Why? Why do we bend to the left? The answer is because when you're facing God, which is God's right? Our left corresponds to God's right. If God is in our presence, we're facing God, so you bow to the left. When you bow to the left, you bow to God's right. So first you bow to the right of God, and then you bow to the left of God, and then you bow to the center. And then we conclude the Amida. But that's the, that's the concept.
we find naturally in the portion of tefillin, it says you put tefillin al yotcho. In Hebrew, yotcho means on your hand. Yotcho is normally spelled with a chaf. It's called an end chaf. It's a long chaf. But in the portion of tefillin, it's spelled with a hey. Yotcho to kenot yad keho. You put tefillin on your weaker hand. In Hebrew, the word keho means weaker. The right hand is the stronger hand. The left hand is the weaker hand. On which hand do we put the tefillin on? On the weaker hand. Right is always the stronger. The left is always the weaker. The right represents, always I said, the power. That's God. He's the benefactor. He's the provider. The recipient to receive something, you don't have to have the power of the one who gives. The catcher who stays at home plate and catches that ball from the pitcher, the pitcher pitches with a, a speed, with a velocity, which is unmatched by most people. But to be a catcher, you just have to be able to catch it. You don't have to have the power. You just have to be able to be in a position to catch what's being thrown at you. Same idea. We as human beings, we as Jews, we catch, we capture the energies which God gives us. And now the question is, what do we do with those energies? Do we utilize them to address the deficiency of the world, to advance it, and to perfect what Adam destroyed? Or do we use it to further that level of destruction, to take the world down even further? The tzaddik, he takes it and invests it to advance the world. So the true partner of God is the tzaddik. They work in sync with one another. This is the idea. There's a verse in Shira Shirin, which was authored by King Solomon, Song of Songs. He says, we find the Jewish people are compared to the dove. Why are we compared to the dove? So the Medjus has many reasons. The dove, every other bird, has multiple mates. The dove is the only bird, only species, that once it has a mate, it never takes another mate. That's the nature of the dove. The Jewish people were committed to God. Any other power has no realm with us. That's one of the reasons why the dove, the Jewish people compared to the Yona. Yona in Hebrew is a dove. Yonosi. God says, it's my dove. The Jewish people are his mate. His mate. Another reason why we're compared to the dove, every other bird, when you slaughter it, it resists and fights. The dove, when it, it realizes you're slaughtering it, it extends its neck to be slaughtered. It submits. There's a level of submission by the dove which doesn't exist by any other bird. The Jews always submit to God. We have that characteristic. Other nations don't submit to God. We submit to God. Therefore, again, the Jewish people are compared to the dove. And God says, Yonosi Tamosi. The word in Hebrew, Tamosi means like the perfect dove, the unblemished dove. However, the Midrash says in Hebrew, a twin is called Taum. A Taum is called a twin. God says, Yonosi, not Tamosi. The Jews are like the twin of God. We reflect God. It's interesting. We find, and we just read in last week's reading, when Moshe was told to go up to the ascent to the top of Mount Avorim, where he's going to pass away, he should choose, take Joshua, Yoshua, and designate him as your successor. And you should take of your splendor, of your radiance, and give it to Joshua. 
It doesn't say all your splendor. It says of your splendor. So meaning Yoshua, as Moshe's successor, radiated holiness. But it wasn't the full radiance of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu radiated at a point that you couldn't look at his radiance. That's how intense it was. Yoshua, he was, he had of his radiance. So the Talmud tells us, if you would want to compare the radiance of Moshe, we say that Pnei Moshe Pnei Chamo. The face of Moshe radiated like the sun. Yeshua was a semblance. That's Pnei Levana. His radiance was only a semblance of Moshe. It was like the moon radiating, reflecting the light of the moon. And this was as a result of what God said, take of your radiance and pass it on to Yeshua. Now, what's the dominant luminary which keeps the world functioning, which warms the world and causes growth? All agriculture, it's the sun. It's interesting. I'm not sure how many millions of miles the sun is from the earth, but if it would be closer, the world would be uh, vaporized due to the intense heat of the sun. And if we be further away, the world would just perish, we just freeze. The distance is just enough to be constructive, not destructive. God is all encompassing. The Talmud asks a question. It says, we have an obligation to cleave to God. Cleave to God. So the Talmud asks, but if God is fire, how do you cleave to fire? So the Talmud says, that when you cleave to the Talmud Chochem, to the Torah stage, and you assist them in earning a living or providing with the means of support, that he should be able to function as that Torah sage. That's called you cleaving to God. Of course, that Torah sage is God's representation on earth. That's how you cleave. Well, what's the question? How do you cleave to God? Could you cleave to the sun? You'd be, you'd be vaporized. You'd be incinerated. But what do you do? The Talmud Chochom, which represents God, he's a semblance of God. Why is he a semblance of God? Because the Navi says, the prophet says, the words of Torah are like fire. And the Torah sage, he possesses that fire, that spiritual fire within him. Therefore, he is a representation of God. So when you cleave to him, it's the equivalent of cleaving to God. So again, what is God? God is Pnei Chamo. God is the, is the sun. He's the dominant human luminary. Moshe, what was Moshe? Moshe was negated to God that there was no trace of Moshe itself. That was his level of humility. He was the conduit. When he spoke, as it says in the Midrash, Shechina Medaber spoke grono. The Shechina spoke through his, through his throat. It was the voice of God through Moshe. He was the, the, he was the conduit. It wasn't Moshe. Moshe was the conduit for God. So what is God? God is the equivalent of the sun. Who are we? We the recipients of that. We the recipients of the Torah. Moshe Kibul Torah me Sinai. He, trans he transmitted it to Yeshua, to Joshua. What was Joshua? Joshua had a semblance of Moshe. But Yeshua was not, was not Moshe. That is, the face of Moshe was like the sun. Because Moshe itself was God's representation. Yeshua was a takeoff of that. Therefore, he is what? He's the recipient. So what God is to the world, and we, the Jews being the recipient, that was Moshe to the Jewish people representing God, and Joshua being the, the success of Moshe was the equivalent of the moon. A woman has no obligation to study of Torah, only the male. What is the function of the woman? A woman is actually a beneficiary and cleaves 
to the soul of, of a man. The Talmud tells us that until the person finds his true mate, his soul is not complete. Marriage between among Jews, you know, in terms of, we speak about the two terminologies used at time of creation, this creation and this formation. Creation is ex nihilo. Formation means things exist, you just coalesce them. When a person gets married, a Jew marries a Jew, the rabbis legislated blessings, and it's the, the text of blessing reads, Asher bora sosa v'simcha, choson v'kalo. God created various levels of joy, and the groom and the bride, he created them. What did he create them? It's two individuals, they, get ready, they decide to get married. No, it's not just two people getting married. Once that union takes place, which is called Jewish marriage, that entity that exists now did not pre-exist. There's a, it's like a metamorphosis of something now that did not pre-exist. It's not that you could take it apart. It's boro. It's boro sasa v'simcha. Chosen v'kalom. It's a new creation. The wife, the world has two luminaries, the sun and the moon. Not one luminary. You need the moon. You need the moon to reflect the light of the sun. The wife perfects the spirituality of the husband. That's the perfection of his soul. And that's why she's, she's the soulmate. Not only she's a helpmate, she's the soulmate of, of, the, of the husband. The Talmud tells us, so therefore, who is the one who's responsible for the maintenance of this world, which is Torah? That's the husband. The male has the obligation to study Torah. He's the provider, even the breadwinner. The main responsibility is on the husband. The wife assists the husband, but she has no obligation to study Torah. Because she's only there to be, to supplement or to complement the wife, the husband. That's what it's about. They work in sync with one another. The Talmud asks a good, a very interesting question. If the ultimate purpose of an accomplishment is the study of Torah, why do the women, what gives them merit, ultimately the end of time, not only that, they're the first one to receive the reward for Torah. The first ones, even more than the husband. The, studies, the husband studies Torah. He addresses the objective of creation. But the wife is the first one to receive, receive reward for the Torah itself. Samara so says something interesting. Could you imagine, you know, you have a marriage and you, you work late at night and your wife waits up late, waits up for you. Supper, she wants to hear what went on during the day, gives you words of encouragement, and she's exi excited for your accomplishment. What does that do for the husband? It gives him encouragement. It gives him value. Her husband works hard all day, comes home, and his wife is sleeping for three hours already. And the morning when he gets up, she's still sleeping. What is the nature of this relationship between these two people? So the Gemara tells us, Talmud says, the reason why the women are the first, have first right on the reward of Torah was when the husbands come home late after they study, the wives wait up for them to show them what they're doing is the ultimate. And it gives them that sense of value, which encourages them to do more. That's firstly. That's why they're even more meritorious than the husband, because they give all the encouragement for the husband to continue doing what he's doing. That's firstly. Secondly, who takes the children to school to be taught Torah by the elementary school teacher? The mother. The father's busy. The mother attends to that for the children that they should be educated properly as children. So because the wife is out there in the playing field, taking the children, making sure they're educated properly, Torah-wise, religion-wise, and they're waiting for the husbands to give them this level of value and encouragement, therefore when reward is doled out, they are first in the line, even before the husband. Because they are crucial and essential for the motivation of the husband to continue growing and going in that direction.
So the primary person is the, is the husband. The wife is secondary, but as much as she's secondary, without the wife, there's no first. There's only first if there's a second. If there's a second, then I call you first. So they work and they complement and supplement one another. God, if not for a Jewish people, there's no world. We are the recipients, but even though we're the recipients, but we give value to God's world to achieve perfection because we utilize what he provides and we invest it as he wants, we should invest it. There's, when people would get married in Jerusalem in ancient times, they would say, how's the marriage? What kind of marriage did this person have? What kind of wife does he have? Does he have a mozza wife or a mozza wife? What does that mean? Did he find, find is in the past. Did he find, or is he finding? Does he have a finding wife? Does he have a found wife? He found the wife. Found or find in the present? What is he referring to? King Solomon writes that mozza isha mozza tov. When you find a wife, you found goodness. If you find the right wife, you found goodness. That, those are the words of King Solomon. Motza isha, you find the wife, you found the wife, motza tov. But if a person, God forbid, marries a shrew, motza isha, raw marmi mobas. I find a wife who's evil, more bitter than death. Hear this. These are Aye. two sides of the equation. Aye. When you find that special wife, motza isha, motza tov. Motza isha raw, motza isha raw marmi mobas. I find that evil woman more bitter than death. So they would ask when people get married in Yushalayim, the ancient in Jerusalem, did he find a motza wife, a found wife, which means that special wife, or does he have a wife in the present, motza? Because the post verse says, I find an evil wife more bitter than death. So the Vilna Gaon says something phenomenal. A person who has things going very well for them. After a while, you get used to it. You don't fully appreciate what you have. So a person has an exceptional wife. Everything works perfectly. Everything's smooth, smooth. It's seamless. It's a seamless relationship. But if it's a seamless relationship and you don't feel, there are no hitches. After a while, you, start, stop, you stop appreciating and understanding how special your wife is. Therefore, Shlomo says, Motza Isha Motza Tov. If you find that special wife, you found it's in the past. Initially, when you marry, you're excited. You appreciate it. But once things coalesce and it's seamless, you don't have the same level of appreciation. But God forbid you marry that true. Every day, there's a new confrontation. I find that woman who's evil more bitter than death. Every day you're getting up to who knows what. You can imagine. Every day... You're experiencing an earthquake. You're experiencing dishes being broken, pots being thrown at you, words, you're being cursed. Your bank account is being depleted. You're getting calls for the bank overdrawn. You don't forget about it. That is always an ongoing, every day they put a, a pin into you. It's new pain. That's mozo. So I'm saying, the wife who's there to compliment you and to supplement you and to work seamlessly with you, she becomes one and the same with yourself. That's the motto. And that's the way it's supposed to be. But God forbid, it's not that way. It's like you buy a, a, a car of lemon. Every day you got it in the garage at the mechanic. One day it's the muffler. The next day it's the, it's the, it's the water pump. The next day it's the, it's the regulator. Next day, you're putting new cylinders. You know, something, this is not what I planned on. It's the same thing. When the hitches continuously and the hiccups, and every day you, you, you're breaking an axle because going to a pothole, you know exactly where you're at. You're on the wrong road. You're not on the road to recovery. You're on the road to disaster, God forbid. You better call the AAA to be towed. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.